Paul, yeah. there's this term epigenetics right. that we're hearing about, I'm reading about for the last few years. And I know you have um, a very good way of explaining epigenetics. It's complex and different scientists, different physicians, different writers um, say different things about epigenetics. Uh, so enlighten you, us with that. So please. you want to hear what I have to say? Yes, okay. I do. Anyway, epigenetics is um, something relatively new that has made itself, uh, it, it's been known in the past and used in many different ways, but more recently epigenetics seems to revolve around what environmental phenomena could either turn a gene on or turn a gene off. And we know the chemistry of that, that a methylation processes within genes can turn a gene off, acetylation can turn it on. But not to get too complicated, probably the most exquisite example without using chemistry very simplistically put is a study that was done um, in Sweden. At the turn of the century in Sweden there was a famine. And as a result of that famine, they found out that the women, they did longitudinal studies, they found that the women who were pregnant during the famine, their children were not affected, but their grandchildren were. Mm. Mm. and that the famine affected the genetic makeup within most likely the X chromosome because it was only the female's grandchildren that were affected by the famine. Mm. And they were smaller and demonstrated to be genetically different than their parents. Wow. So that would be an environmental factor. If there are chemicals or substances within our environment, are they capable of turning the gene on or gene off? Uh, one study that I thought was fascinating, I don't know if it's been replicated, is if there are, mice have litters, mm -hmm. and some mice, as you know, um, will be very nurturing, and they nurture by licking their, the siblings within that litter. Mm -hmm. And there are also a breed of mice that don't lick their children, mm -hmm. okay? The children or the siblings, not children, <laughs> the mice that are licked, they don't have any evidence of diabetes, hypertension, or obesity. Mm -hmm. The ones who were not licked had diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. Mm. So then they did a study where they took the litter of the unlicked mice and put it with a licking mother. Mm -hmm. And those mice did not have diabetes, hypertension, or obesity, mm -hmm. nor did their next generation of those mice. Mm. So therefore, there are certain things that might turn a gene on or turn it off. Bruce Lipton talks about belief systems. Mm -hmm. Is belief an epigenetic phenomena that how we, you know, how we think we are in some way? Has this been proven at, at this point? No, but it's something we're beginning to look at. I'm for most interested in repetitive historical familial patterns mm -hmm. and is there a possibility that a psychological phenomenon could be handed down from generation to generation and that could cause a change in a gene. Now there were two cases today that were phenomenal for me. Both were breast, breast carcinoma. One woman's breast carcinoma began 18 months after divorce, uh, mm -hmm. divorcing her husband. Now, Carl Simonton spoke about this years ago. The stress, a shock to the system within 18 months to 24 months prior to the onset of cancer. So stress would be an epigenetic phenomenon. Mm -hmm. The University of Washington found that stress such as death of a family member, retirement, 
separation, or divorce, all led to coronary heart disease, a very high incidence of coronary heart disease. All of those phenomena that I mentioned, those sociologic phenomena, are associated with abandonment. Mm -hmm. The impact of perhaps even abandonment on as being an epigenetic phenomena. Is this an epigenetic phenomena? I don't know. We're studying these things right, right. right now. It's being studied at MD Anderson. Uh, there are so many uh, clinics that are beginning to pay attention to this. And if it's simply a chemical transposition between methylation or acetylation that could either cause a cancer or move us towards a remission, then we have another way to treat cancer. Mm -hmm. But stress is so important and stress must be resolved as soon as we're aware of it. Now sometimes it's said, one of the theories is not that stress causes cancer, but if there was some cancer there, stress will depress the immune system, so then right. there's fertile ground right. for the cancer to grow. And that's it, the possibility. It could have been dormant there for years or decades. Exactly. Until something wakes it up. But, but, the, um, but this is yet another possibility. Right. That through stress um, or any shock or bolt to the system, system. that these genes can turn uh, or, on or Or off. some um, environmental phenomena that's occurring. Right. You know, Einstein said something that had a profound effect on me. Um, he was, it was on the Brownian movement, he, he looked under microscope and microscope uh, oil immersion and there's a piece of pollen floating on oil. And he's looking under that microscope and up until that time everyone said there's something intrinsic within that piece of pollen that's making it move. Mm -hmm. And Einstein said no. I have a sense there are things we don't see that move what we do see. Mm -hmm. And he gave birth to subatomic particles. Right. I have a sense in medicine there are things we don't see yes. that cause what we do see. And epigen epigenetic phenomena might be the thing we don't see that causes what we do see. Interesting. And this brings another issue when we talk about um, observation that we mentioned the other day. When we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. Absolutely. So if we're looking at or focusing on cells, if we're focusing on tissues, if we're fo focusing on an uh, organism, then that intention could also change. Yeah, that I can see. be in ourselves or others. I see this as a, a in, in psychology. Unfortunately, the observer we always are looking for the familiar, right. but if we could begin to see everything new in the present moment. So I think one of the things that has been so difficult for cancer is we see it almost the same way all the time. We see it with fear. Yeah. But what if we change our observation of it right. and see it as something that has potential for cure? I think that is, again, changing our view, changing our observation, and perhaps getting a different outcome. And when we see those people who are beating all odds and doing way better than the statistics, they have a few things in common, and one is that they're seeing their illness, at their cancer as something that they can um, cure, they can be cured from that. Uh, or they can overcome it, or they can keep it under control for years or they can or change their life. Right. Meaning something has changed. It. Rather than living in the fear about a job that I must have, I must keep, now they have cancer and they think, I don't know how much longer I'm going to, I'm going to live. Maybe I could do something else that really moves me. Yeah. And uh, this is really important. The willingness to change. The willingness to see life through new eyes. Right. Great.